When we change from Cartesian to circular polar coordinates in double integrals, we always change the dx dy to r dr d theta. In this presentation, I want to give you some idea of why that extra factor of r is necessary. I'm not going to give a rigorous proof, but just a pictorial representation that I hope will convince you. Let's begin with the Cartesian situation. I've drawn here a point with coordinates x, y, and then I've increased the values of x and y by amounts delta x to the right and delta y upwards. I've completed a small rectangle with the corners having the coordinates as shown. I've also indicated the area of that rectangle by delta a. I'm sure you can see that the width is delta x and the height is delta y. So delta a must be equal to delta x times delta y. When we talk about small quantities which however are not vanishing we usually have the convention of using the symbol delta a small piece of. So delta a is a small piece of area or an area element. Delta x and delta y are small pieces or small increases in x and y. When we do infinitesimal calculus, such as differentiation and integration, we take the limit in which the small amounts disappear. Delta x and delta y go to zero, for instance. But sometimes we want to record a memory of the existence of those small quantities. So, so we change their name to dx and dy. When we say dx and dy, we're talking about vanishingly small increases in x and y. In this picture, of course, that will also lead to a dA, and we can write dA equals dx dy. Hence, when we do a double integral, we have dx dy for the integration variable. I now want to look at the circular polar case. This is a little bit more complicated to draw, so I'm going to build up the diagram gradually. I've started it on the next page. OK, here we go. I've drawn two rays. Remember a ray is a radial line leaving the origin and heading outwards. I've taken them both to have length r, but one is in the direction theta, and the second is a slightly increased angle, theta plus delta theta. I've marked the delta theta in. So that the diagram doesn't get too cluttered, I'll now remove the two headed arrows I hope you've got the idea that both those lengths are r. There we are, I've removed those now, but instead I've added the coordinates of the two points at the end of the rays, r theta and r theta plus delta theta. I'm now going to connect those two points up with a piece of a circular arc. Next, I'm going to extend the two rays by a small amount that we will call delta r a small increase in the radial distance. I'm then going to connect up the new ends of the rays, making a kind of slightly circular sort of rectangle shape. This little enclosed figure at the end of the rays has two sides of length delta r, I'll mark that in in a moment, and it has two circular sides. Those circular sides progress through the angle delta theta. Let's put in the delta r's. There they are, and I've also marked the extra coordinates. So we've now got four corners for this region with the coordinates marked. This region, of course, is a small region of area, so we could call it delta a again. We'd like to know how to write delta a in terms of the delta r and delta theta. Well, that region is not rectangular, but if delta r is small and delta theta is small, it's very close to being rectangular. So to a good approximation, we can say that delta a is just the product of the sides. One of the sides is certainly delta r. The trouble is the two curved sides are slightly different in length because one is further away from the origin. However, once again, if delta theta and delta r are both small, 
then those two curved sides are very close to being equal in length. And if we let delta r and delta theta disappear and become infinitesimally small, then the two curved sides will approach each other in length. Now we need to remember about how to get the arc length around a circle. The distance around a circle, remember, is calculated by taking the radius multiplied by the angle. In this case, we can take the radius to be r, because delta r is going to be vanishingly small, and we can take the width in angular terms to be just delta theta. So both those arcs are very close to having length r delta theta. We can therefore assume that that little region is approximately rectangular and write delta A equals delta R times R delta theta. There's our delta A. I've used the approximately equals symbol just to remind ourselves that it wasn't really exactly a rectangle. But now, as we let the delta R and delta theta shrink to nothing, that figure will become just as good as a rectangle. We can therefore change the delta A to dA and write the delta R times R delta theta, pulling the R to the front, as R dr d theta. This equation is exact in the limit of a vanishing delta R and delta theta, so we can write equals. And this is the quantity that we use in our double integrals. There's that factor of R. It comes from the formula for the arc length around the around the uh, circumference of a circle. That r you will sometimes hear called the Jacobian factor, or just the Jacobian. It's named after the mathematician Jacobi. In other areas of mathematics we use other kinds of coordinates. For example when we do three-dimensional integrals we need sometimes spherical or cylindrical polar coordinates. In that case we have to work out the Jacobian factors for the conversion from Cartesian to those new coordinates. In relativity we use four-dimensional coordinates of many different kinds depending on the context. In every case we need a way of calculating the transformation factor from one coordinate set to another. In other words a way of calculating the Jacobian. I'm not going to do that in great detail here, but you will sometimes hear the Jacobian called the Jacobian determinant, and that's because it can be constructed as a determinant containing partial derivatives of the various variables. In the case of circular polars, the Jacobian determinant looks like the following. If we remember that x is r cos theta and y is r sine theta, then we can evaluate this determinant as follows. First we perform the partial derivatives, then we write out the formula for the determinant. Recognizing that cos squared plus sine squared is 1, we end up with the predicted result. The Jacobian for the circular polar coordinates is just r, and so we use dA equals r dr d theta in our double integrals. That concludes my discussion of this topic.